In October 2004, a war broke out in the small town of Dover, Pennsylvania. Today, the teachers in a rural Pennsylvania town became the first in the country required to tell students that evolution is not the only theory. It started when the Dover Area School Board passed a policy requiring that its high school science classes include a controversial subject called intelligent design. Proponents of intelligent design claim that many features of living organisms are too complex to have evolved entirely through the natural process of evolution, as Charles Darwin proposed. Instead, they claim some aspects of those organisms must have been created, fully formed, by a so-called intelligent designer. And advocates contend intelligent design is a bold new scientific theory with the power to overthrow the theory of evolution. It's scientists debating science based on the evidence, not based on any religious text or authority, and it's clearly uh, properly the subject of a science class. It's in fact opening the path of inquiry uh, to new ways of thinking about things. Evolution by natural selection is a scientific doctrine, then a critique of that doctrine is a legitimate part of science as well. The Dover School Board demanded that science teachers read their students a one-minute statement claiming that gaps in the theory of evolution exist and putting forward intelligent design as an alternative. The statement also directed students to an intelligent design textbook called Of Pandas and People that would be made available. But many Dover residents and an overwhelming number of scientists throughout the country were outraged. They say intelligent design is nothing but religion in disguise, the latest front in the war on evolution. The goal of intelligent design is to try to re-Christianize American society. Intelligent design is not anywhere a scientific concept. It's not a field of science. It's not being actively researched by anyone. It's a violation of everything we mean and everything we understand by science. The stage was set for a battle that would pit friend against friend and neighbor against neighbor. It was like we shot somebody's dog. I mean, there was a blow up like you couldn't believe. This is like a civil war within the, the community. There's no question. Before it was over, this battle would land the school board in federal court. No cameras were allowed in the courtroom. So to bring this historic showdown between evolution and intelligent design to light, NOVA has dramatized key scenes from court transcripts. It was a six-week trial in which modern biology was Exhibit A. And hanging in the balance was not just the Dover biology curriculum. The future of science education in America, the separation of church and state, and the very nature of scientific inquiry were all on trial. In Dover, Pennsylvania, the debate over religion and evolution has long been personal. We live in a community that has a great many fundamentalist churches. I've never appreciated the fact that my children are being taught to believe in evolution as opposed to creationism. In the beginning, God created. To me, that's all I need to know. Located in the southeastern part of the state, about 20 miles from the capital, it's a quiet, rural place, home to about 20,000 people, more than a dozen churches, and one high school. One of the first people in Dover to sense that trouble was brewing was Bertha Spar. She had been teaching science at Dover High School for almost 40 years. In the spring of 2003, she received some disturbing news from the school district's assistant superintendent. He actually came to my classroom one evening after school uh, and said, Bert, I think I need to give you a heads up. There is a school board member uh, who is talking about equal time, uh, whether it be 50%, but certainly equal time uh, for creationism, and I think you need to be aware of this. Uh, that's when the red flag went up. Another science teacher, Brian Rehm, heard this too. 
I had actually laughed at him because I thought that was the funniest thing I'd heard. I mean, creationism was ruled out as public education and science when I was in junior high school. When Bertha Spar asked which school board member was interested in creationism being taught alongside evolution, she was told it was a local businessman named Alan Bonsell who had recently joined the school board. My family and I have been very blessed here, and I've had family that have lived in the Dover area for 100 years, so it was something that, to give back, and I thought I could help try to make Dover, you know, the, the school district a better place. When Bonsell had questions about how evolution was taught at Dover High School, Bertha Spar and her biology teachers agreed to meet with him. I had a meeting with some of the science teachers in the high school just to see what they taught or didn't teach in the high school science class. And creationism really didn't come up no, at that meeting. No. It was more, how do we teach evolution? And he seemed very satisfied. He was okay with how we taught. We thought everything was good. And we if went on our merry way. If you recall, he did enlighten us at that time that he did not, it wasn't yes. his belief is that evolution was how things came about. Right, that's correct. He felt there were Earth was not much more than 4,000 years old. I personally don't believe in Darwin's theory of evolution. I'm a creationist. I make no bones about that. Creationists, like Bonsell, reject much of modern science in favor of a literal reading of the Bible. They believe the Earth is less than 10,000 years old and that God created everything fully formed, including humans in just six days. Although most mainstream religions made peace with evolution decades ago, many creationists still see evolution as incompatible with their faith. And both creationism and evolution are no strangers to the court. Their legal battles stretch back to the famous Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925. Now, as I told you yesterday, Darwin's theory tells us that man evolved from a lower order of animals. In that case, a high school science teacher in Tennessee named John Scopes was accused of violating state law by teaching evolution. I hereby place you under arrest. Loosely portrayed in the classic film Inherit the Wind, the trial turned into a courtroom showdown between legendary lawyer Clarence Darrow. The defense wishes to place Dr. Keller on the stand so that he can explain to the gentlemen of the jury uh, the exact meaning of the theory of evolution. And three-time presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan. If you had a son, Mr. Sillers, or a daughter, what would you think if that sweet child came home from school and told you that a godless teacher... Yes. Scopes was found guilty of teaching evolution and slapped with a mere hundred dollar fine. But the verdict would have a chilling effect on science education throughout the country for the next three decades. After the Scopes trial, textbook publishers decided that evolution was just too controversial a subject, and so they just quietly removed it from the uh, textbooks. And for most of that time, the textbook was the curriculum. And so if it wasn't in the textbook, it didn't get taught. The chilling effect of the Scopes trial did not thaw until the 1960s. But as publishers slipped evolution back into their textbooks, creationists fought to teach their views in science class as well. Over the next 30 years, the two sides battled it out in court. The fight culminated in 1987, when the Supreme Court decided that teaching creationism in public school science classes violated the separation of church and state, mandated by the Constitution in the Establishment Clause, which prevents the government from promoting or prohibiting any form of religion. To this day, teaching creationism in public school science classes anywhere in the United States remains a violation of students' constitutional rights. Another Dover school board member, Bill Buckingham, a retired policeman, was appointed by Alan Bonsell to head the curriculum committee. It was his job to review all requests for new textbooks. The ninth grade biology teachers had asked for a widely used book co-authored by biologists Ken Miller and Joe Levine. But Buckingham did not like what he saw. 
In looking at the biology book the teachers wanted, I noticed that it was laced with Darwinism. I think I listed somewhere between 12 and 15 instances where it talked about Darwin's theory of evolution. It wasn't on every page of the book, but like every couple chapters, there was Darwin in your face again. And it was to the exclusion of any other theory. And at a school board meeting in the summer of 2004, Buckingham made it clear he wasn't comfortable approving that book. The school board put the purchase on hold. So what was it about Charles Darwin's theory that Buckingham objected to? Darwin published his theory of evolution in 1859 in a book called On the Origin of Species, and it has been sparking controversy ever since. It was the culmination of work Darwin started more than two decades earlier, after sailing around the world on a ship called the Beagle. On that expedition, Darwin collected thousands of plants and animals that were unlike any he had ever seen before. And when he returned home to England, he became particularly fascinated by the many different birds he had found on a remote chain of islands off the coast of South America called the Galapagos. There was a bird that looked to him like a warbler, and another one that looked to him like a woodpecker, and another one that looked like a finch, and so forth. And he wasn't sure what these birds were, but they were all clearly adapted for very different ways of life. Some ate insects. Some, for example, picked up small seeds. Some could crush the large seeds of certain plants which were found on the Galapagos. So they had different appearances, different beaks, different styles of life. When Darwin asked for help identifying these birds, he was in for a surprise. He was floored, he was stunned to discover that the expert ornithologists in Great Britain told him, they're all finches. That's not a woodpecker, it's a finch. That's not a warbler, it's a finch. But why, in this small chain of islands, had he found finches with such different characteristics? Darwin reasoned that in nature, individual organisms compete for limited resources, like food. If, for example, a bird is born with a slightly larger beak than the other members of the population, that might give it an advantage on an island where large seeds are more common. Over many generations, birds with large beaks would be more likely to survive and reproduce, handing down this advantageous beak shape to greater numbers of offspring than those with smaller beaks. Darwin called this process natural selection because the forces of nature, such as the environment of an individual island in the Galapagos, select those organisms best suited to that environment. And he believed that over time, this could give rise to new species. What Darwin pointed out was a general principle, which is easily observed in nature. Species are not fixed. That with natural selection pushing or pulling or splitting, species can change over time. Darwin thought all the different kinds of plants and animals we see around us today, including humans, could have arisen by this process. He called the gradual evolution of new species from old descent with modification. And he pictured the relatedness of all living things as a great tree of life, with each twig a different species, ultimately springing from a common ancestor. As you follow the family tree farther and farther back, say from our twig, which we're just one twig on this vast tree. What you see is our similarities with apes, then going further down, our similarities with other mammals, further down, our similarities with reptiles, further down, our similarities with amphibians, fish, all the way down to worms and jellyfish and so forth. What you see is a continuity of life on the planet. That is, we're not exceptional in any great degree. We're just a twig on a giant evolutionary tree that includes everything.